Hello. Hey. So, if you follow us on Twitter, you've already heard the beginning of this story. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Twitter drama? Twitter tea? <laughs> no. Uh, Have we already been shut down? Elon Musk already took us out? I'm, I'm sure he's getting to us. I'm sure we're on the list <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. No, I tweeted about <laughs> my therapy session last week. Okay. It's something you can tweet about. Of course it is. If, if you're mentally ill and an oversharer like me. <laughs> i spent the whole session basically bitching about capitalism and she was like well this was not what we planned to do today but like i'm really glad you told me this because like like i got a lot of insight into how you go about your day i'm like yeah this is just me all day always angry (laughs) (laughs) i explained to her that lenin was a class trader and i hold that fact close to my heart (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, can you imagine just explaining to like a nice, just regular ass counselor woman like, so Lena was this thing called a class trader, and that means... <laughs> yeah. Like, what? She's just like, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. She's like, well, I learned a lot today. <laughs> yeah. That's the, you know, I mean, definitely it's encouraged, you know, if you need it go get therapy and and do all that mental health stuff but i mean at the end of the day kind of they they kind of teach you how to cope day to day you know that's kind of outside of their scope (laughs) yeah they will not have advice for the revolution sorry guys i mean if you find one that has advice for the revolution let me know i will pay them a lot of money to help me (laughs) and to help the organization uh, yes (laughs) we need them uh (laughs) that's funny though therapist become more revolutionary please (laughs) do it probably easy to do right how hard could it be (laughs) you'll be upset all the time apparently (laughs) i mean it does like the, the the point i guess is that like i was explaining the the kind of and this makes me sound like i'm like fucking in the matrix or something but like the frustration of walking around every day like facing or knowing about the injustices of the world and the looming climate collapse and just like all these horrible things are happening. And like, it feels like people don't give a shit. It feels like not only they don't give a shit, they like don't know about it. It feels like everyone's walking around with a veil over their eyes, except for like a few people. (laughs) Yep. That's what historical materialism will do to you. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it makes me sound, it makes you sound super like snooty or crazy, like tinfoil hat wearing, like no one can see the truth but me. (laughs) You you start to think like, God, it'd be so much easier. I could like put this away. And in some ways you have to just to like go about your day to day life and not drive yourself insane. You know, like she asked me, she's like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I just like listen to podcasts and read a lot of books and like watch a lot of Star Trek. I just escape into other worlds like fiction. That is what I do. And that's sort of, yeah, everyone's going to have some sort of an outlet to to not be in that mode forever. Yeah. I mean, unless you're the dedicated revolution. If you're eating raw meat and you're getting buff. <laughs> getting buff. Just stick with it, you know? I mean, yeah. one day you'll lead us all there, but we need, for the rest we need of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rest of us need some sort of escape. I think maybe that points us in the right direction for our next communist movie night. It should be They Live. Mm, wait, what is that? So that's essentially the premise is guy gets the cool sunglasses. Okay, I've heard this reference without actually knowing what it is. Yeah, and he, he gets these cool sunglasses that like show the secret who likes people who are secretly aliens trying to Whoa. destroy the planet and like advertisements and stuff are all like obey and stuff. They have secret subliminal messages behind them. Oh, that's where the obey things comes from? Yeah, maybe. Um, I was just on the Wikipedia page and it said it influenced him. So, I guess, yes. Anyway, it's a <laughs> candidate for it. it. It's it's that notion of, like, damn, am I the only one who sees this shit sort of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, we can add to the list. <laughs> okay, let's get into today's tale, which I think will be a little shorty but that's fine because we're both very tired. It's a late night recording. <laughs> it's a late night recording. You guys probably have places to be, things to do, uh, apocalypses to lament, <laughs> etc. So, yeah. Okay, so let's get into it. Today we're going to talk about the Chiampi Revolt 
1378 in Florence, in what is obviously today Italy. All right, 1378, a good year. <laughs> Great times. Everybody who was in the loop remembers that Charles IV, the Holy Roman Emperor, visited his nephew, Charles V of France, that year <laughs> to publicly celebrate the friendship between their two nations. That's what's... Is that the first thing on the list? That's the first... That's happened in January of that year. That's Slow why it's Slow news year. Uh, <laughs> this is also when Tokhtamish dethroned Temur Malik to become Khan of the White Horde. Kind of cool. A big shout out to the Tokhtamish fans out there. <laughs> You've been waiting for it. Now's your moment. Yeah. If you didn't like Gregory the Ninth, he died that year. So it's a Great. You know, good year for you pour one out for a real one <laughs> sorry greg yeah <laughs> hey some highlights of three thirteen seventy eight. <laughs> a good one a banger of a year for real okay so let's talk a little bit about medieval governmental structure okay yeah i mean i don't specialize in this but i know a little bit i don't either <laughs> i watched a black death lecture series and did some extra googling and that's how we research this episode. <laughs> All right. I like it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the term commune. I think we hear it and we're like, fuck yeah, it's yes, not rad. want to be there. Yes. Sign me up. So the medieval sense of the word is almost like a term for town. Shit was pretty dangerous back then. You had like bandits on the road and just like random people could like just accost you. So these kind of sprung up based on mutual defense of like these walled cities where peasants could gather and be you know, protected from bandits and also from like exorbitant taxes from like the church or like royal officials who are just like, fuck you, pay me, that kind of thing. And so there are these self-governing cities. So is this similar to the like the French term of commune of like, it's just our city government sort of thing? Yes, definitely. Okay. So this was happening kind of throughout medieval Europe. Um, what's interesting is that eventually um, places, I would say, categorized more in the north, so maybe UK and stuff, seem to continue with this model a little bit longer than Florence. Modern day Italy develops into what we know of as city states. So these powerful, independent cities that they're basically like many countries. They do their own thing. Yeah, like Gen Genoa was a, a big deal. They were their first, like, kind of ascendant one. I mean, they were, like, world power there for a little while, right? Definitely, yeah. Like, the the way the lecture series put it was, like, you wouldn't negotiate with, like, you know, Italy. You would negotiate with each individual city-state. You'd have negotiations with Venice. You'd have negotiations with Genoa. You'd have, like, all of them were separate. Okay, gotcha. This, you know, saw the decline of, of the communes in that area and the rise of more of an oligarchy. In Florence, this was called the Signoria. Um, this is largely based on guild representation. Um, so we've talked about guilds before on the show. I think of them as proto-unions, but shittier. <laughs> okay, like more restrictive or like more reactionary or what? I would say I think a good union puts its workers first, you know. I think the guilds put their workers in there, but I don't know if they're first. I think profit is still first for these guys. But profit not for the workers, but for who? For the industry, I guess. Mm, okay. So they definitely, you know, will fight for worker protections, but only insofar as that, like, well, we're losing money if, like, so many people get injured, that kind of thing. So it was less of a union in terms of binding the workers together, but more like of a, mm, our modern equivalent would be like an industry group, like... Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And I think that becomes clear when we get to the class structure of Florence because it is very striated. Is that the word? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I would it's use very... like a uh, stratified. Stratified's the word I was looking at. I was missing a consonant in there. I think striated <laughs> may be like a geological formation. It's in but... layers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I Which think that's is. a word. But... <laughs> it's fine. It's it's a very divided society. So I once we like... Not all guilds are created equal, I guess is what I'm going to say. So the guilds also, just to clarify, they, they, they have the bosses in there too. Like it's just like, you know, the blacksmiths or whatever includes like, you know, your artisan blacksmiths that own their place, but also their apprentices. Like it's it's everybody. Um, I don't know about the apprentices because you have to be of a certain age to have guild membership in most places. Mm, okay. So you might not be able to get membership till you're like 
a full blacksmith or something. Yeah. So I would say like one of the differences between like guilds and unions is I would say like how we characterize bosses. I think in our parlance, bosses are, I mean, we've talked about this too. It's like, it's not just a manager. It's like, you know, the owner, you know, who owns the means of production. And in this case, like these guild members do kind of, they do own the means of production. Like I am a blacksmith. This is my blacksmith shop. So it's not like they have all these like, you know, they don't have a board. They don't have like a CEO. They don't have investors, which right. all come with like actual capitalism. We're still working in pre-capitalism here. It's like proto-capitalism. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got you. So they may still hire out labor, you know, laborers or whatever. Mm-hmm. But they're not up to the tier of, they're not up to the scale. They, we haven't reached industrial capitalism yet is what you're saying. Yes, that I think that's a good way to put it. I, I think too, when even when you talk about hiring out laborers, I think that comes into play a lot because not all guilds are created equal, and not everyone's in a guild. Like there's a lot of inequality going on. All right, cool. That's gonna stir or the pot. Rather not cool. <laughs> not cool at all. <laughs> okay, so the Signoria is their structure of government. They are made up of the Priori which is nine members chosen from the guilds of the city. You got six from the major guilds and you have two from the minor guilds. So not all guilds are created equal. Major guilds are things like cloth merchants, uh, bankers, and then the minor ones are like more people who work with their hands, basically. So artisans of all kinds, uh, shoemakers, tailors, wine merchants. So there's kind of a disparity in that as well. The last member of the priority was something called, and I'm going to butcher this, apologies to any Italians we have listening. Uh, so, hey, <laughs> watch what you're saying here. Okay. Uh, so they were called the Gonfalonier of Justice, uh, which is kind of like their top cop. He's in charge of security and maintaining public order. So they're not So the good. attorney general? Yes. I, I think that's a decent enough metaphor. Okay. So you have the heads of your various local car dealerships and various <laughs> local businesses plus uh-huh. the attorney general or the or the DA I guess <laughs> it is kind of the DA yeah it's not just the heads though um to be part of the priority you're actually selected by randomly drawing names out of a bag every 2 months so you just had to be a guild member you had to be over 30 not in debt you could not have like served recently, so you can't like get drawn twice in a row, and you can't be related to any other members. So like if you know your dad got drawn and then you got drawn, they're like, yeah, that's not gonna work. Okay, so a lottery system. That's one of the proposed sort of things in in anarcho sort of communist style yeah. things. It's like, why don't we just pick somebody? You know? Yeah, I mean that sounds like a pain in the ass. I'd be really mad if I got picked. Like, oh. My I but you don't do have this, to do it the next year if, if that happens. At least there's that. There's a time limit. <laughs> <laughs> I have one year to leave this fucking place, so I don't have to be picked again. <laughs> right. Uh, so we got the council of signiores. Mm-hmm. And then we have the, oh, what was the name for the district attorney guy? Uh, the Galfonier. The Galfonier. Um, Gon- no, Gonfalonier. I missed another fucking consonant. <laughs> syllable that so what is their 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 top cop but like do they have command are they like mayor and council or like they seem to be fairly equal there is a different structure that can sometimes pop up these seem to be a little more ad hoc and these sound like the coolest fucking deck of cards ever you have the ten of war eight of security and six of commerce (laughs) so these are like (laughs) councils of different people who who come help run things when needed yeah, that sounds like a tarot deck. Okay. Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you got the six of commerce today. You better watch out for your yeah. for your money. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For real. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, so kind of like a first among equals sort of structure. It seems like it. Yes. Um, you also have the, the collegi. Uh, it's college with an I. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Um, but this is elected councils um, in addition to the signori. So I guess these are like non-guild people. I didn't do a ton of research into that. Uh, But overall, the Signoria run the city. Okay, gotcha. Okay, let's talk about class, our favorite thing. Yeah. (laughs) So at the top of the society, you have the patricians. Basically, yeah, they suck. That's an appropriate reaction to to a patrician. (laughs) (laughs) If you have a family name, you're in, you know, as long as your family name's not like Taylor or 
Smith, like, you know, an artisan name like that. Yeah, um, if so. it's like Julius or something or yeah, like a, yeah, one of the old Roman ones, I guess. Yeah, so these are these are rich people. They largely run things. You, then you have the artisans, which you have a wide spectrum of that. You could be on the Signoria. You could, you know, have guild membership. You could be, like, living the high life. Or you could just be, like, a guy. You could have no guild membership. You could have no representation in government. Um, and remember, you could also be in a guild, but, like, be in a shitty guild. So, like, you, there's a wide spectrum of artisan work. You might be living the high life or drinking Miller high life. It's a spectrum. <laughs> exactly. The champagne of beers. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. I love me a... Uh... A lowbrow beer any day. I can do it every now and then. You I'm can just attest. Big... My fridge half the time is just got Miller Lite in or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'm just not a big beer drinker. I stopped pretending to like beer in college when I realized I don't need to do this for anybody. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> you do you. Thank you. I do. I drink a lot of cider. Next come the working class. Yeah. Woo. Love these guys. So you had this huge influx of laborers, um, poor laborers coming into the city for work, and they had no guild membership, which meant they had no government representation. These are called the soto posti, which based on my limited understanding of Italian, soto means like underneath. So not sure what posti is, but that can't be great. Yeah, I thought it was like without, like, uh, like oh, shit, soto vos, is isn't, isn't, oh. that, that, isn't that a term like whispering, basically? Oh, we could just look up Soto instead. We could just look up Posty now. and Yeah, we could just get all of it. Soto Posty. No, I tried Googling this and it's like, oh, it's the masculine plural of Soto Posto. Like, all right, asshole. Well, then do Soto Posto. To undergo Submit? questioned. Submit. That's not a great translation. Well, Soto Posto Wiktionary says. Submit. The refer. adjective says subjected to. Subordinate mm-hmm. is the noun. So yeah, yeah, it's it's <laughs> under like was there, okay. Inferior, yeah. Yeah, that's not a great class term. <laughs> yeah, fuck the guys who gave us this name. <laughs> These are the underlings. That's, that's very out there in the open. <laughs> Just <laughs> yeah. mask off. All right, inferiors. <laughs> These are the poor. Oh, we look down on them because they're so. You got tall. your patricians. You got your guild. You know your uh, your artists and high guild life members. And Miller life ones, and then you have your underlings your yes. inferiors wow okay so no mincing words yeah right all right so why is there this huge influx of labor and uh i'll answer my own question i guess <laughs> i was gonna guess that maybe oh yeah guess maybe uh sort of roman empire style they end up doing like big huge plantations or slave labor or something like that some other way to like you know, put these people out of jobs in the first place? No. Um, right. well, could be worse then. I mean, it was worse because oh. it was the Black Death. Okay. That's. <laughs> it's probably about equal That's up bad. there, yeah. That's up there. <laughs> Things we hate, just straight up dying, being enslaved, both bad. <laughs> both bad options. <laughs> So, in 1348, uh, the plague swept through Florence, killing 60% of the population. Dude, you want to know what else happened in 1348? Yeah, give me the highlights from that year. (laughs) Let's see. There was the Battle of Streva. The Teutonic Order secured a victory over the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Big L for the Lithuanians. Fuck yeah. Eat shit, Lithuanians. Sorry if we are from there. Stefan the Mighty, Emperor of Serbia, conquered Thessaly and Epirus. Way to go, Stefan. Couple of notches in Stefan's belt. (laughs) Good year for Stefan. If you, you know, were just kind of not really the biggest fan of Lawrence Hastings, first Earl of Pembroke, this August 20th, 1348, you could kind of toast to his death. I mean, I didn't have any opinions about him, but, I mean, sure. Oh, Giovanni Villani, hometown favorite of Florence, a chronicler there, died of the Black Death. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. So He wrote down, everyone's dying, and then died. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> if it you were dying, you wouldn't bother. But, arg. Oh. Yeah. All right. Oh. There's 1348 highlights for you. This is my new role on the show. <laughs> I love it. I mean, you heard we had a short episode. You said, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. So yeah, bad times in Florence, 
you lose 60 percent of your population you're going to have a huge hole in the labor pool particularly in florence's leading industry which was wool this employed up to a third of florence and wool Damn. is a very labor intensive thing um it's not just like shearing the sheep it's also uh carding the wool dyeing the wool weaving it like all kinds of shit knitting it into fancy ties Yes, exactly. <laughs> For your stodgy professors. Yeah, so a third of Florence was making wool ties. Got it. <laughs> it only ties. It was weird. <laughs> People are like, I'm cold. All I have are these ties. I just layer a bunch of them like like a make to make a horrible pauldron of ties. <laughs> yeah, like you would be wrapping your feet in wool <laughs> ties to stay warm in the winter. A good fashion look. <laughs> So the wool industry being so big, um, there is a particular group of workers called the Chiampi. They actually get their name from a bastardization of French, which mm. is Campar à loi à bois. I'm sure that's terrible, but it translates to comrade, let's get a drink. Hey, I like these guys. <laughs> I know. Cool. I'm like, yeah, man, you can knit me a sweater and we can drink together. It sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what were the Chiampi about? Drinking, being comrades. <laughs> so they're most associated with uh, wool carding and uh, just textile work in general. So they, they are a part of that, that soda posti, the kind of under class of, of workers. And, but I would say they are the more radical side of that, as we will see later in the story. Okay. So kind of like in French Revolution, you have a lot of discontented masses, and then you have like the more radical ends of it, like the Jacobins and whatnot. Yes, yes. So they have reason to be upset. So you've got all these people coming in and they are ripe for exploitation. <laughs> so only 200 of the 14,000 people, you know, all those people, what was it, a third of Florence in the floor, the wool industry, mm -hmm. only 200 of those people qualified for guild membership. Damn, everyone else was just in the inferior category, right? The... So mm -hmm. to posty. Yes. Um, and so what happens when you don't get guild membership is you get exploited like crazy. They did things like forced loans, super high taxes, uh, really low wages, and just crippling them with massive debt. Debt was so high that some people would like put up their looms as security for a debt. Like what they were making the wool on? Yeah. So if they failed to pay the debt, they were, they were just out of their way of making a, a living? Yes. Damn. All right. Yeah. Um, some loans for weavers came up at, you want to guess the percentage of interest? <laughs> what do you think the interest rate was in 1348 in Florence? Oh, man, this is hard. I don't have my handy dandy inflation calculator. 1378, so. excuse me. 1378. Well, considering that this was the year of the Battle of the Votes a River. <laughs> You know that's going to change some things. Uh, I'm going to say the the interest rate was a whopping 90%. Uh, double it and you're a lot closer. It was 200% <laughs> interest for these buckers. Like a year? Jesus. I am not sure of the exact terms of the contract. I do know the painter Giotto was called out for like benefiting off of this in some way. So like now I don't like his paintings as much. Who nice was? frescoes. Giotto, he was like a early Renaissance master, very early. But also like a loan shark? I think so. Damn, what a jerk. <laughs> yeah, someone correct me if I'm wrong and I'm fucking slandering Slander. Giotto. <laughs> Giotto. He's going to haunt me tonight like, fuck you. Can't stand for this Giotto slander. <laughs> Unless I it's get true. Canceled. Unless it's true. <laughs> I write a lot of random shit, so <laughs> it's all just floating in there. All right, so everybody's who has the money is loan sharking everybody who doesn't yes let's play a game of would you rather the penalty for uh dyers not like people who die but people who die wool if you fucked up if you made an error in quality so i guess if you you know this is too red this is not red enough whatever yeah this is blue it's supposed to be red <laughs> your punishments could be a fine equal to 571 dollars today or Losing your right hand. <laughs> uh, Alex, I'm going to have to go with the, the fine. But I guess if I was up to my eyeballs in debt and didn't have the money, then... Guess you're losing a right hand. Damn. But then, chop, chop. like, 
what am I going to do? I'm not going to be a dyer anymore. Yeah, right. Not a not a very good. I'm probably going to make more mistakes now that I only have one hand. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, right. You'd think like bad bad plan, bad management. Come on. Jeez. Okay. So that's how 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 all powerful these guys were. Yes. Yes. And in contrast, that is how uniquely exploited this group was. Um, and I people knew it. You know, they they were not allowed to associate, particularly the Chompi. In 1345, you had a guy named Brandini who tried to organize them with these public meetings. He got put to death. Whoa. <laughs> like, they were like, we're absolutely not letting you do that. What did they, what did he get put to death for? Just for talking to them? Yeah, for trying to, like, organize them into some sort of guild or workforce or, like, you know, to give them power in some way. They said he was, like, trying to do a rebellion? I don't know the exact charges, but... I mean, it was Defo in response to him trying to get them together. Yeah, wild. So, All right. And, I mean, it continued from there. Like, no no more than six cloth workers could gather together, even for religious purposes. So I guess you got to, like, work out shifts with the local church. Like, I'll go to this cathedral. You go to the one across. <laughs> like, yeah. It sounds like a pain in the ass. What if your whole family is <laughs> in the cloth industry? You have to split up. To go to, yeah, start hiking to different churches or whatever. <laughs> right that's obviously very bad uh there is one tier below this which is kind of the the miserables these are people with no property no trade or profession this is also about 22 percent of florence Mm -hmm. so these people also had no representation in the government obviously so yeah all this big old pool for for inequality so everything sucked for most people (laughs) <laughs> For most people, things were bad. I mean, 22% had nothing. Uh, a third of people had wool jobs that were ungilded. And then you had the rest of society. Damn, all right. On top of that, you have constant squabbling between the major and minor guilds, trying to vie for power. A lot of major houses go bankrupt because of the plague. There's also high taxes due to military campaigns. And one thing that I really appreciate about the the documentary series I'm watching, the it's a lecture series really, is this the explanation they had for the social dynamics in the plague. When you have a plague that kills 60% of the population pretty much indiscriminately, you are naturally left with a lot fewer people at the top of that pyramid. Makes sense. So 60% of the you know noble population is way more than 60% of the peasant population. I guess in proportion. Like, they notice it more? I don't know. Like, it's m- way more people die in the 60% of the peasant population. No, no, no. I guess what I mean proportionally. It's If it's 60% across the board, you are proportionally going to have fewer nobles at the top. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, yeah. I see what you're I saying. I did a bad job. You end up with, like, math. three dudes <laughs> instead of yes. thousands. Okay. What's left over is less. Yes. And um, you also had a bunch of nobles try to flee major metropolitan areas because they're like, fuck, plague is coming. So you had even fewer people left in charge. So people were still doing that back then. Oh, yeah. Because that was the thing, you know, (laughs) in the early days, everybody starts moving out to the country. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that totally happened here. Uh, People just abandoned their posts. Like, absolutely not. (laughs) Okay. This leaves, obviously, quite a power vacuum. And the rising merchants and guildsmen are like, yeah, I'll take that for sure. Mm-hmm. They're called the the gente nuova, uh, but they're basically the bourgeoisie. They think they're cool now. Yeah, right? They're like, sure, why not? I'll take it. How hard could it be? <laughs> it ended up being kind of hard. They had to fight the oligarchy for power between 1375 to 1378. Um, they eventually settled on a truce, but like, it was still not the most stable structure. You also had a war going on with the papacy in Avignon, which put mm. added pressure on the situation. Like, it was just kind of a fuck, fucking fuck mess. <laughs> fuck, fucking fuck mess. <laughs> it was wild. Things it was wild. Was wild. Times. Yes. You had taxes so bad that farmers were fleeing their lands, which just worsened the labor shortage. So, like, things got so bad that you actually had a kind of a proto-revolt in 1343 of the wool workers. That's not the one we're talking about today, but, like, Tensions were definitely ready for it early. So it's kind of like now things are kind of gradually crumbling. And it's like (laughs) a little hyperbolic to say everything's going to collapse tomorrow. But you can kind of already see pieces in place. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Let's get to the the action, though. Here we go. In 
April of 1378. Some of my dates conflict here, so if I have the month wrong, apologies, uh, but I believe it's April. Workers from minor guilds demand more representation in the Signoria. They're like, hey, this sucks. We want more of us here. The Sotoposti, so those ungilded people, were like, hey, we would actually like some of that representation too. We don't have any. <laughs> so this is like the meme of like, you're only getting paid this much. You're getting paid? Like <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> or like the skeletons underwater meme. Like, <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the Soto Postis submit their own demands for representation. In response, the Signoria hikes up the admittance fees for guild membership by, you want to take another guess at a percentage here? A percentage. A hundred percent. Double the price. Well, guess what? It's quadruple. Four hundred percent. Okay. All right. <laughs> like, they're just like, no. Just close the door. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, so this this pissed them off. And, like, these guys were very reform-minded before that. They're like, we're not trying to take things over. We're just trying mm-hmm. to get to see the table. But this pissed them off so much. They're like, you know what? I'm going to talk to those rowdy-ass wool workers, the Chiampi. Because they're, like, kind of lower than them. But they're like, fuck it. You guys suck. You're obviously not going to listen to me. I'm going to go talk to them. Mm-hmm. And in June, June 22nd, 1378, the Chiampi took up arms and attacked government buildings. Heck yeah. Parody, parody, parody. Heck yeah. (laughs) My quote unquote favorite. Uh, (laughs) They attacked monasteries. They burned down palaces. They released inmates from prisons. They raised the blacksmith's flag at the palace of the highest ranking member of civil government. Dude, what is the blacksmith's flag? I don't know, but I bet it's cool. <laughs> I don't know. This looks pretty generic, but uh, it's not probably not like a real blacksmith's flag. It's just like some blacksmith's tools on a black flag. Um, I looked at blacksmith's flag Florence. Oh, they have a flag for the guild. Oh, it's just like some tongs, bro. Hell yeah, tongs all day. That's not a flag. <laughs> That's not a flag. It's That's just like, like a, a coat sculpture. Of arms thing. Yeah. yeah, it's a coat of arms. Okay. Tongs all day. Maybe they just wrote like a flag that said blacksmiths on it. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. It was probably cool. I'm sure it was cool. Also cool. Wink. Not really, but you know what I mean. Dave and Dan, shut up. Go away. Uh, <laughs> they hanged the public executioner by his feet in front of the town hall. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> nice. Taste of his yeah. own medicine. So I kind of, I mixed some of the, the stories in there. So that, some of that took place later in July. Sorry. I got really excited talking about violence. <laughs> as one as want to do. It Don't happens. apologize for the terror. Um, it's the righteous expression <laughs> of the oppressed masses. Yeah. That's our, that's our violence of the, of this story section. We'll get to more <laughs> of it, but that's the first part. So basically in response to this June uprising, the Signoria freak out. But not enough. (laughs) They try to negotiate, but they still weren't offering guild membership or government representation. They were like, ah, we'll listen to you. We'll like lay off of some taxes a little bit. Like they they were really like mealy mouthed about it. (laughs) Interest rates are down to 180%. (laughs) It's very reasonable. And and that's when the rest of that violence popped off. So um, July 21st, uh, the Chiampi and the Soto Posti take the fuck over that's when they raise that flag that's when they hang that public executioner and they place a guy named michelle delando who is a wool carter as the gonfalonier of justice all right new da new da better than the last one hopefully mixed bag this guy is draped in a lot of what i would call heroic imagery there are statues of him in florence today um he's kind of seen as like a folk hero sort of thing and I get it. He's got this super humble background. His his mother was a washerwoman and his wife uh, ran a butcher shop. Um, and according to legends, he was barefoot when the people demanded that he take power. Man, didn't even have any cool kicks. <laughs> but I mean, it's, you know, classic rags to riches story. Like, look, this guy's of the people. He's totally going to lead us. And yeah, it doesn't work out super great. But, <laughs> oh. you know, I, I get the appeal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So people thought he was going to be cool. People thought he was going to be cool. But, I mean, the real downfall of this whole thing is reformism. That's the name of the bad guy today is reformism. Oh, he tries to be moderate? He does. Mm. So it's kind of like a like a 
Nicolas E. Madero kind of guy. Mm, I don't know who that is. In the Mexican Revolution, like the guy at the very beginning, he was like the presidential candidate against Diaz. Mm, and he's okay, like going to be okay. the the big, you know, the big change guy. But then he just kind of like does a little bit of reform and everyone's like, this sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what happens here. They force the Signoria to establish three additional guilds, which is like, okay, you didn't even get rid of the other guilds. You just want more guilds, whatever. Fine. That's a little, that's, that's not really quite what people were expecting. Right? Like, cool. I mean, some of them probably were. That's probably like, you know, the original guys, the, the Soto Posti, that is what they asked for. It's like, we would like guild membership. So mm-hmm. he did that, but like, you could have done more. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's the thing. They reduced the judicial corporal punishment. Um, they reformed the tax system quite a bit. You know, they did a lot of really wimpy things. They like, n- instead of like canceling debt, they suspended debt collection for like a while. So this was, uh, this was the Joe Brandon of Florence. <laughs> Joe Brandon of Florence. Joe Brandoncio. <laughs> you know, Biden probably was also barefoot when we elected him. Probably because he was out of his mind. Just wandering around his house barefoot. <laughs> He's got soup for brains. <laughs> oh, anyway, <laughs> so all this to say, obviously this is not a communist or a socialist or even proto-socialist revolution. I think yeah. there's some interesting threads in here, but like these guys are not demanding ownership of the production. They're not even demanding like complete and total rule. They are still trying to co-rule with these motherfuckers who are like, exploiting the fuck out of them it's a real bummer and stupid move but that's this guy right like the masses were trying to do more than him though weren't they i will say one thing that seemed to bolster some of the like the tax system reforms and some of the other like later reforms that they end up doing is they had popular support like the the guys in the so the signoria all live in like one palace they were scared out of their fucking minds because there are like mass like crowds outside every day. Like you better fucking sign that. And people <laughs> so, getting executed and stuff. Yeah. I don't, really actually up to this point, the only guy that died was that public executioner. Fair enough. But it kind of stills your heart to think <laughs> I'm not exactly thinking about meeting out the death penalty to these guys considering what they did to the, the last yeah, I'm guy. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure that played a factor. I might be a little more lenient to these dudes. <laughs> seeing what they did (laughs) yeah like i think i'll give them a tax reform actually there's a lot of people out there who look pretty mad (laughs) yeah (laughs) so i would say it's a popular revolt uh but you know not our usual fare one thing i do want to give them credit for the the previous total guild membership was between four thousand to five thousand people adding these three new guilds as much as i've made fun of it added a membership of 13,000 people to guild status. Oh, that's a lot. So now, like, almost all the male population could now participate in government. Like, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, that's a lot more. So way more democratic. Like, we'll give them props for that. So one of the downsides was, despite the name being the Chiampi Revolt, only about half of their body was, you know, what I would call true Chiampis. Uh, so, you know, the, the classic wool carters, the shit stirs, you know. Fuck yeah. Yeah, Um, the punks. The real punks. (laughs) You also had a lot of competing interests. Um, So there were a lot of squabbles. And Delando seemed to be allying himself with the higher ups. They saw that kind of going. They're like, you're being too, you know, reform minded. You're not pushing hard enough. And so the Chiampi in response grew more radical. Mm, Okay, so they're like, you're just trying to be in the room or whatever. You're just trying to be at the table. You're forgetting about us, which I'm, by the way, picturing him as Lando Calrissian. So, <laughs> exactly, he's an Italian Lando Calrissian. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that is definitely the characterization. Uh, I one anarchist perspective I read said, "quote Power makes one giddy and brings madness." Uh, mad like Michel de Lando, who, when he became a leader, took up his sword against his former comrades in sedition. Yet, when barefoot, had been the bravest champions of popular revolt. They elevated themselves above others. They took power, and that was enough to transform them from rebels into dastardly tyrants. Yeah, okay. That's, <laughs> yeah, I can see that analysis. That's sort of a similar critique that some anarchists have about, like, the Bolshevik Revolution mm-hmm. and stuff. Is that, oh, then they get power mad, and they go after their erstwhile allies and stuff, and 
only care about power. I can, I can see that common thread. Yeah, I mean, I I can see that, and I don't think that was the only thing going on. I guess I would say either that's going on and that's bad, or that was the perception of what was going on, and that's also bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I he, gotcha. sh- he should have been more among the people to like so that they trusted him. But also, it's, it does sound like he was kind of like once he got in there, he got a little more milk toast. So yeah, and that's the importance of like having a an actual organized party or organized something mass movement union whatever you're doing it through because if it's just popular demands and then one dude you know <laughs> it's really easy to separate off that one dude and say hey you know we we understand that you're like the spokesperson for them you're really cool and here's you know here's what we're going to do for you and they can wine and dine you really easily yeah i don't know to like to what extent he was you know corrupted or or you know or not not even corrupted outright, but like made to think that you're really doing as much as you can for people. Yeah, he got West Wing brained. Right, yeah. That's the thing. It's <laughs> like, oh, I'm doing what's reasonable but good sort of thing. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. can't blame everyone else for going out there. Yeah, but this sucks, you know? Like, this is not enough. Exactly. So you got the Chiampi who are like really mad. Uh, there is a quote from the revolt. I think it was taken from like a cloth worker of... of that group who said, quote, we shall turn the city upside down. We will kill and despoil the rich men who have despised us. We shall become masters of the city. This is the part that's a little weird. We shall govern it as we like, and we shall be rich. <laughs> so not quite revolutionary, but why not? Uh, what is our, I guess what, we could all be rich. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing is it's, it's everything in common. The bounty of the earth is enough for all of us. Mm, okay. I interpret it more of like, like we're going to be the... <laughs> mm-hmm, like we'll be the top guild or whatever. We'll make them work for us. <laughs> but no, like the, the, the commonwealth of humanity and everything, you know, all for all. Okay. Maybe I like that interpretation a lot better. That's, That's what I'm sure. going to go with. Because the rest of it was badass. <laughs> like, the rest of it was really cool and I loved fuck it. Fuck this. We're going to take <laughs> over. Those, those, we're going to kill those bastards. <laughs> Do it. Fuck Yes. So a group of the Chiampi called the Eight Saints. Uh, these are the most radical of the group. Again, very cool tarot deck we have going here. Um, <laughs> these guys created a sort of shadow government or shadow organization that worked to protest Delando's government and veto his legislation. Ooh, okay. Uh, but like, so they were uh, in the new in the new guilds, like the new representative people. Like they, I believe so. Yeah, but they now they turned against Delando. Okay. Thanks for letting us in, but fuck you. <laughs> you actually suck. Delando did not like that. In August of 1378, he arrested uh, two Chiampi leaders who were demanding constitutional reform. In response, there was a militia demonstration for from the three new guilds who were calling for his resignation. He shut this down, and it resulted in fighting between the Chiampi and all the other guilds, basically, uh, resulting in one of the bloodiest days that Florence had seen up to that time. Damn. So they were like battling in the streets, basically? Yes. Yes. Full on. For some reason, I, I mean, this hits me as gruesome. I don't know if it will with you. They they made a note that like the Butcher's Guild is particularly violent. And I was like, oh, gosh, <laughs> they're just out there with like a cleaver. Yeah, man. They got weapons. <laughs> so, yeah, it was real nasty. And you may think, okay, that's the end. You know, the the guys took back power and sort of it's a less thrilling ending than maybe we would like for the show. It kind of fizzles out. The Chiampi as a whole remain in power. I'm putting this in air quotes for you until 1382. But their power begins to kind of sap away. Disputes between the different types of wool workers, because remember, Wool is a really expansive business. Everything from wool merchants who are rich to like the dyers who are getting their hands cut off. These guys start having disputes. And in that chaos, you have elites stepping back in to take power. Is that also has a plague died down some or? Yeah, by this point. So the plague kind of comes in waves after the, the initial first wave is in like 13, 1348. And but it does come back every like. I think it's only like 10 or 20 years. Um, this could be for multiple reasons. It, there's a lot of interesting biology involved in the plague. 
I'm not sure if they were in a wave or valley. Is that the opposite of a wave uh, <laughs> um, at this time? But yeah, the, the issue is that like the structures they set up, which is to say not very many, start dissolving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, they have to come back in regardless. Yeah. The, the new guilds they set up get dissolved. Like they just, they're not a thing anymore. JK. <laughs> Non-gilded workers were branded as criminal and heretical. Some of the reforms remained, such as the the easing of taxes. They're like, all right, that one's probably good. We probably got a little out of hand there. <laughs> uh, but overall, this whole, you know, shebang led to kind of an increase in authoritarianism and the rise of the Medici family in Florence, because they're like, that got mm. out of hand. We need some rich people in charge. Yeah, those guys were powerful dudes definitely i don't know too much about their details i just know that they had like popes and stuff too oh yeah like, they had a, their finger in every pie <laughs> they had multiple fingers <laughs> all the pies nasty <laughs> get your finger out of those pies we're trying to eat those so it fizzles out and then the medicis end up raking it in yeah actually interestingly enough a medici was in power before all this popped off and like he's often blamed for like how badly things went <laughs> So I guess they're like, we'll try again. Can't be that bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Guacamole's not going to be in charge this time. <laughs> to get Rich people else. have endless chances is what we've learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, makes sense. I mean, we had a capitalist in charge of the U.S. before we spiral into the Great Depression. <laughs> you know what will get us out of that? Another capitalist. Oh, for sure. It's going to be great. <laughs> So, I mean, that is like the general arc of this, uh, but the reason I want to talk about it and like why it's on a communist podcast is that I think it's a great example of people taking power in a pre-industrial state. This is before material conditions could allow what we think of as a classic Marxist revolution to take place. The bourgeoisie was barely developed. Like we touched on it just a little like, yeah, you had some rich merchants who benefited from like the plague and like the vacuum of power there. And like, you started to see some of that. You started to see just a hint of, of that kind of uh, power structure. But I like it because it it's like that thing you always say, but like people always stand up to power. Like we, we think of it as this unstoppable force that like no one could do it until this one cool guy had this idea. But like, that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. Karl Marx didn't invent the idea of rebellion. <laughs> he didn't invent the idea of like, hey, I'm being oppressed. I would like to not be oppressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, because we've got some time, I have a whole list of medieval revolts, some with fun facts. Ooh, yes. Okay, let's go down my list. So part of a larger pattern here. We got the Chompy Revolt. It tried, it failed. All right, what do we got? 1225, the Valencians, which is in modern day Spain. Similar to Florence, their economy was dominated by cloth workers. They deposed the town council, seized the assets of the rich, and declared a commune. Hell yeah. Pretty cool, right? Were they like stomped out or something? I don't know the ending to any of these stories. <laughs> ah, okay. This <laughs> is just the teaser trailers. Next, 1280 in Douau, France. There's so many vowels after this. D-O-A-U-I. That's too many vowels, guys. Yeah. Daoui. Daoui. <laughs> Sorry. No idea. No idea. All right. But shout out to Valenciennes <laughs> and... <laughs> Yeah, whoever you are. They had some strikes, led to street fighting and social revolution. Um, in Belgium, um, in 1280, uh, you had guilds arming their members in outlying villages, just like, come on, y'all, we're going to fuck fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. 1281 in Provence, France, uh, the mayor tried to add an hour to the workday, and the workers hanged him and burned his house down. Very French, very French. <laughs> Extremely French. One extra hour of work. Excuse Fuck me, you. one hour? I will not. Yeah. I mean, here we are, you know, any, if, we're, if we're not working overtime, we're accused of quiet, quiet quitting, quitting or whatever in an organized, you know, media onslaught propaganda machine. And uh, the French. <laughs> French peasants <laughs> try to make them had any a better more... work-life balance than us. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> so good. Let's see. In Paris, you had some strikes going on to protest high inflation and rent in 1306. You had a five-year peasant revolt in uh, Flanders in 1323. Oh, I like this one, too. Uh, Breslau, Germany. 
well, modern New Germany. Again, countries weren't really around right now. <laughs> but in 1329, you had leather workers who resolved to go on strike for a year <laughs> for higher wages. Damn. They're just like, fuck you guys, we're out. <laughs> You guys don't need leather, right? We're done. We're done here. Uh, they were unfortunately done here because they got blacklisted. So, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Bummer. Let's see. In Siena in 1371, uh, hiked food prices led to weavers striking for higher wages and also pillaging some rich people's houses. You know who don't who didn't end up blacklisted, at least what you said, uh, or at least you didn't mention it, were the, pe- were the ones who hanged their mayor. <laughs> You know, it's not, it's a little harder to turn around and say, you know what, I'm going to hang, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, you know what, you. I'm going to blacklist people. You know, if your predecessor was hanged for just suggesting, an hour. hey, let's work an extra hour. <laughs> it's not a bad strategy. Just say. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, it has, while we can't endorse it in the current day. It has worked historically. All I can say is this history is cool. No ties to modern times. Just cool on its own. Don't even think about it too hard. Yeah. (laughs) Out of context, cool. Uh, (laughs) Bohemia, you have kind of a religious take on this. Um, So this is in modern day Prague. Uh, You have something called the Taborites, uh, which is a subsect of the Hussites, which, I mean, that sounds sounds much sluttier than what it is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, but the Taverites basically started their own society where they abolished private property and held goods in common um, as like a kind of religious sect. Uh, dude, awesome. Right? They also had a really cool banner. Oh, yeah. I think I looked that one up. With the angry goose or an angry swan. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. I almost sent that to you, but I didn't want to give it away. That's excellent. I love this angry swan. I don't look into taborism, see if it's not like, I don't know, heretical in an actual Christian theological sense. I don't know too much about that, so it's probably fine. And then I'll just I'll just become a taborite, like they sound dope. I mean, I do like your angry bird flag. It's very good. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Extremely good. Well, Jan Hus, I want to say, was kind of cool. Or Jan mm-hmm. Hus, I don't really know how to say his name. It's spelled crazy. Yeah, I thought that the Hussites were kind of cool in a way. I don't know all their details, and I'm pretty sure everyone did bad stuff in the wars that they ended up in, but... Yeah, I'm seeing some nasty battle pics. Well, it's sort of because it's battle. Yeah, you right? You see, like, pleasant <laughs> battle pics? <laughs> Just a guy and a horse having a good time. It's like flag football or something. Well, hold on. One of these is labeled Burning Adamites. That can't be good. Ooh, Adamites. They were kind of nice. I think they were like nudists. They are or nudists. They wore no clothing okay. during their religious services. These guys were like everyone's. I don't remember. It was like everyone's sinners. And so. Let's all get naked. Do what you want. Or if it was like no one can sin because they're great or something. I don't know. Holy nudism. Rejected the concept of marriage as foreign to Eden. Lived in absolute lawlessness, holding that whatever they did, their actions could be neither good nor bad. Yeah, that's kind of cool, too. That's I don't pretty know. cool. I remember I briefly read some about these various groups back when <laughs> Terrence was talking about them on the Trailbillies. Like mm, okay, random. so you, you've dipped your toe in the Taborites before. <laughs> Not your first run in with a Hussite. Yeah, I've, I've, I know my way around an angry swan or two. <laughs> and finally, to round out this list, you have the English Peasant Revolt in 1381, obviously quite an uprising heavily influenced also by the black death so all that to say like this isn't a coincidence this isn't like a fluke this isn't like wasn't that crazy when those crazy italians got all mad like this is a pattern yeah i got the name wrong on the guy who was beheaded in the english peasant revolt it was watt tyler was the guy okay so he was there the leader of the rebels in the english peasant revolt uh I tried to read about it to add to this episode, and I got bored. Can you tell me the story of the English Peasant Revolt? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the Peasants' Revolt in England was essentially started by a poll tax. They taxed every adult, whether peasant or wealthy, four pence. So a poll tax doesn't mean like a ballot tax? or No, just like just to be... Okay. Just to exist. It's not um, like you're going to vote. Like it's not like peasants were voting. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. it's a different than the modern usage. Uh, okay. 
This is just like a per head tax. Like if you exist, okay. you just have to pay this. Whether you were peasant or wealthy, you had to pay this, which I don't have an inflation calculator for thirteen eighty one. So come on, inflation calculator. Not sure. Get your shit together. <laughs> it's probably a lot. Based on all the the fantasy books I've been reading, which is a lot, that sounds like a lot. They were also like basically living in serfdom. And they were demanding like that they could go work for anyone of their choice, basically an end to serfdom, you know, and an end to this tax and everything like that. Uh, the way that uh, Watt Tyler ended up sort of becoming the, the spark for this and then the leader for this is according to, a, you know, either a story or a legend or, or what have you, poor records. But uh, one account says uh, that this poll tax collector who comes around to collect this money, like in our modern term, sexually assaulted uh, oh. his daughter. Oh, shit. Uh, like pulled up her clothes to see if she had arrived at the age of puberty. Whoa. And so Watt Tyler killed him. Yeah, good. Uh, and everyone rose up. Everyone was like, fuck yeah, let's do this. Yeah, that guy uh, sucked. And so he ends up leading like groups of rebels and they kind of converge on London uh, where they attack, uh, they destroy like legal records of like people's, you know, n debts and deeds and stuff like Fuck that. Yeah. Uh, opened up prisons, uh, killed people who were supposedly associated with the government, anything like that, you mm -hmm. know, just started attacking people. Just some cool stuff. <laughs> the king comes out, a high schooler, a freshman, 14 years old. <laughs> Can you imagine a 14 year old telling you to do anything? <laughs> <laughs> no no shade to our to our younger listeners oh yeah sorry i forgot we have teens out there you guys would be good at it because you're good communists good anarchists you'd abolish the kingship yeah you'd be a great king because you wouldn't be a king exactly <laughs> but 14 year old kings i mean the only thing stupider than just a regular king as a child it's a king. 14 year old one yeah not great he, he's like okay yeah i'll meet with them they they go out there, Tyler goes to talk to the king and puts forward his demands or whatever, but apparently he's like rude, or mm. the people around the king are like, how dare you, you know, talk to him this way, mm -hmm. and all this sort of stuff, and so he, he gets insulted, this guy, Sir John Newton, insults Tyler by calling him the greatest thief and robber in all of Kent. Whoa, and okay. so he kind of goads him and Tyler attacks him, but then gets restrained. And it's this big scuffle, basically. He gets wounded. He tries to ride away. But the the mayor of London tracks him down and they uh, decapitate him publicly. Whoa, okay. So, yeah. And then they, they display his head out there on London Bridge or whatever. And the, 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 the movement falls apart at that point. And the, rebel, the rest of the rebels are hunted down and executed. Nasty stuff. Yeah. Ugh. So, like, it didn't take that long, I guess, it sounds like? No, that's that's all in... The main action of it is 1381. So, yeah, I mean, all that to say is this is a pattern, you know. You can't just go fucking enslaving people and get away with it forever. <laughs> At some point, someone is going to rebel. Maybe it's only going to be for a short period of time. Maybe it gets squashed quickly. But I think there's something very hopeful about that. Yeah. In a in a religious lens, these sins are punished. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. on earth. <laughs> sometimes we get them here. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, yeah, sure. Sometimes you do have Henry Kissinger's walking around, <laughs> you know, and doesn't look like that guy's going to get any modicum of payback. A listener sent us a betting site for his death where you pledge an amount to like a... Uh, an organization that benefits like Cambodia, one of the places he oh, ruined. Nice. And That's awesome. you get to like bet money on, on when you think his death day will be. <laughs> That's very good. Shout out to that listener. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me look up who it was on Instagram. Shout out to Cassidy for sending that. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was good hilarious. I, I mean, I wrote down for discussion questions like where did this revolt go wrong and like what we can learn from it. And I, I think the answer and not to sound like one of those guys I think it is kind of some lack of theory, though. Like, I think you didn't have, I don't know if it's the idea or you didn't have the the follow through to 
not just look at it and be like, well, we're going to add some more guys to membership. That's like taking over the Senate and be like, I'd like to add some more senators. <laughs> like, that's pretty <laughs> bonkers. Like, you took over the Senate. You can do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. Sometimes there's discussion about, oh, what if we... Uh, what if we are able to kind of legally reform our way to socialism and stuff? Mm-hmm. Or like we will start passing constitutional amendments or things like that. It's like, guys, if we're able to get the numbers together to do that, why are we limiting ourselves <laughs> in, the, in those ways? You know, exactly. Like, yeah, I've I've been thinking about that a lot. I mean, it's it's election season, and my phone's been blowing up. Like Bernie personally texting me, Beto personally texting me. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I one of them was like. It was it was like Bernie and it was like a picture of him and it just was like I don't you know. up. It was it was something like really cash. <laughs> it wasn't that level of cash, but I almost texted it to you. Let me find it. I'm once again asking you for your financial support. No cap. <laughs> no cap. No, it just said hi, Christine. It's Bernie. But what was funny is you know like the the iPhone does like hey Siri found a contact like it said Siri found a contact Bernie and then a phone number <laughs> I'm like, oh great Bernie Sanders phone number I'll take that <laughs> yeah so anyway so yeah I've been thinking about that a lot just because it's election season and like it's it is frustrating you know back to my therapist conversation too of like having all these huge existential problems and having someone just to tell me to go vote and you know, she didn't do that, but I, I told her that people do that a lot. <laughs> so she didn't do it. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I, I have daydreamed before of like, oh, what if we could do it peacefully? What if, and by peacefully, I guess I mean by voting, but what would that look like? And I think you're right. Like, if you get to a point where you have voted every single member of, of Congress in, in as a socialist, like, then you're going to have to get rid of Congress next. <laughs> yeah. No, there's, I mean, what we are, okay, in the American context, because it's different for every country, but still, I think the fundamentals hold is that we're living in like a, the strangely, slightly reformed structure of a slaveholder's republic. Yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, that's how it was built. And we've, you know, made some big modifications and some small, uh, lots of small modifications to make it what it is today. But like, that's what it was built as. Like, you should be looking at getting rid of that entire government structure with whatever you're coming up with next. I mean, fuck, at least the Signoria had guild memberships, like some kind of regular people potentially in there. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and that's what you would need to be looking at when you're creating your, the next thing is, you know, okay, well we want to have this many seats in our national legislature dedicated to, you know, the working class, this many Mm -hmm. dedicated to uh, women, this many dedicated. I mean, like, that's how they literally have done it. In socialist states, you also talk about, uh, like, in East Germany, for example, they had the different groups, the fronts and all that, you know, uh, the mass organizations, you know, something besides just let's have this one, you know, these different fiefdoms with two rep- two senators each. <laughs> let's have, uh, you know, let's count some of the enslaved population to to, to boost <laughs> the Southerners' represent. Like, you know, there's all this bullshit that they had and that we still, you know, the Electoral College and everything, that we still have the, the remnants of that we can't possibly be like, oh, yeah, this is a good starting point for what we're building next. No, no. Like, this country was founded on the blood of indigenous people and slavery. Like, throw the whole man out. What are yeah. we still doing here? And, and you know, we're kind of a uniquely bad settler colonial project. But who is it that said it best? That, like, how did you even get your wealth in the first place? If you're looking at a country that didn't have that situation, like England, mm-hmm. how, did, how did your rulers get their wealth in the first place? Because they had swords and they took it from someone else. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Like that, that is, it comes down to, you know, my rock is bigger than yours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to go back to Engels you know, conception of the formation of the state. It's just a way for the class in power to stay in power and to bludgeon everyone else uh, into staying in there, in there. What was it? The staying in the Soto Posti, staying Soto Posti. They want you to be Soto Posti. They want everyone to. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's tempting to say, you know, what, what if we could vote our way through this or, or, I understand that, too, as a stepping stone for getting some people on board, because I do feel like there are a lot of things like regular people can agree on of like, hey, let's, you know, get money out of politics or like what, you know, that kind of stuff. But even if like the best case scenario, you manage to do all those things like you can only do those things so far before like 
the real guys in power. Again, you know, I sound like tinfoil hat man now, but <laughs> before they do something about it. <laughs> no, I think you're right. And I think maybe the extent to which you write about mobilizing people with it or getting people's kind of toes dipped into the waters with, uh, you know, electoralism or whatever as their first step. It's only useful in so much as like to show them that it fails. Yeah. Right? I guess like, <laughs> if you want to set someone up. Well, yeah, you can't hold it up as the end all be all because it's not. And it's going to fail. Like you have to know it. Like it's going to fall short. Even if we had succeeded beyond our wildest dreams <laughs> and we had gotten Bernie elected, he would have disappointed us. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'd be out here trashing him right now. So that's, I don't know, maybe something that uh, we could do to to onboard people, but we have to figure out how, what's the next step once once they they see that like, oh yeah, well, the elections are either going to be rigged against us or even if we get someone in, they're going to pull a Lando and... <laughs> and uh, compromise. Yeah, I think you're right. It's not a great onboarding tool. It, it can work in some situations. I'm I'm thinking of it's a good demonstration of how corrupt the system is as, as a whole. And it's like a very obviously corrupt system that you can point out and be like, yeah, our elections are really fucked up, right? Like, that doesn't make any sense. But I mean, you can do that with almost anything. You'd be like, hey, you know, the last time you went to the doctor and it cost a million dollars, like that was also fucked up, right? <laughs> like, there's yeah. so many other things to point to. So maybe that's not the best avenue. <laughs> Yeah, or you can have them uh, read or listen to if they like, you know, listening to people. You can point them our way, but if, mm-hmm. or read about like labor history in this country or in your country. I had a friend of mine, uh, you know, I'm Stephen, mm-hmm. recently came out to me as a socialist. <gasps> I'm so proud. Yeah. We got another one. <laughs> <laughs> He'd been reading this book that I had seen in our local library and had thought about reading over the summer. It's called uh, The Devil is Here in These Hills. It's about uh, West Virginia coal miners and and like the labor history there and everything by James Green. And so, I mean, you know, I mean, this covers like sort of some of the stuff we were we've we talked about in Harlan County, any of of that sort of time period. I mean, this is also talking uh, somewhat about the kind of lead up to the first Red Scare and all that. So. (laughs) Uh, so yeah, now, now he's just like, I'm a socialist. So. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. So get your friends tuned in to, <laughs> to us or just, you know, if they're more of an independent reader, there's tons of history. Like I said, in our country, in your country, wherever you are, there's all sorts of, there's a reason. And that's the cool thing about history is it's the reason the world is as fucked up as it is now. You know, so you can go back and look and be like, man, the first red scare, the second red scare, the cold war. <laughs> we keep war. doing stupid like, shit, huh? Yeah, it's not an accident. We didn't just stumble into this reactionary world. It's like been a process ever since the Chiampi revolt. They, they they come in and they stomp people down or the peasants revolt. They cut people's heads off or the, you know, the, the red scares. Uh, they deport people in mass numbers and arrest them in FBI raids or blacklist them in Hollywood or whatever. Like there's a concerted effort to make it to where communism and socialism are like these these terrible words in our political language now. Well, that's funny because like you, I mean, maybe this is very telling of our perspectives, but like you're saying, like that's why history is horrible because it, it always like stamps them down. I'm like, oh, that's why it's cool because someone always stands back up. Yeah, that's the flip side of it. I guess I was focusing on, <laughs> on the negative side of it. But yeah, you're right. There's That's the reason why the people are in power that are in power now, right? And the systems and everything. But like you said, people have stood up in history and continue to. Like, I mean, we see that today. I mean, what, Brazil was was yeah. hitherto, you know, governed by a, a right-wing quasi-fascist guy. Bolsonaro, he's on his way out now because Lula's back. So it, you know, people people do fight back. It was uh, what's well, it? Colombia that has like a former guerrilla leader um, what? as there. Yeah, I think that's right, Gustavo Petro. I know that all I know about the Brazil guy is that, like he's kind of hot in a dad bod way. Lula. Yeah. Dude, Lula's <laughs> old man. Yeah, I know it was a very it's a grandpa <laughs> dad kind of situation. But uh, no, bod. he's he has been hot. There was a picture on he has I saw been on hot. Reddit that was like him. Back in the seventies, leading like a steel workers uh, strike or something, because he's been in the union movement 
uh, for a long time. But like Lula 77, 79, something like that. I'll just send you the link. I just found it. Oh. Ooh, yeah. Isn't that cool? That's like a like an Oscar Isaac sort of look. Yeah, I'm into it. <laughs> okay. So yeah, confirmed. Hottie. But no, he's been in the labor movement forever. Uh Lula has. But Gustavo Petro in Colombia, he's he's their president now, uh, was yeah, in the nineteenth of April guerrilla movement there. Wow. And now is president. So I mean, you can go from being completely persecuted and, and the government trying to hunt you down and everything to not so, not so bad. I mean, again, though, those are electoral victories. They are. And I guess we're, so what we're saying you, I'm, I'm calling you. I, up. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Cause I'm, <laughs> I'm realizing the inconsistencies. It's not enough to settle for that or to channel everything into it, but it's not bad. It ain't bad. No, I'm not mad about progress, it. To, well, to make progress on that front and then push beyond that. Like, I think that it's uniquely bad in in the American experience because it seems like the best we can do is to get a fairly sympathetic ear in a thoroughly bourgeois party. Whereas these are, I mean, like if you're talking about either one of these guys or the general, what they call the pink tide in Latin America of like kind of socialist leaning, you know, groups and stuff like these are, these are way more socialist leading parties than us. Yeah, I'm sure we would be putting out. So, okay. Okay. So that, yeah, that is a different context, I guess, because I mean, we're like, you know, imperial core country, just bullshit. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's another thing though. Yeah. Is we're basically when we're onboarding anyone from, (laughs) from the American context, it's like baby's first socialism in like the baby's socialist country. Like, because we're, because (laughs) you can't lead with like, we want to take America down like. 19 pegs and and make sure that the rest of the world rises up against us like can't be your first pitch it's like if someone on the death star was like we should elect a new leader besides vader it's like well you're still running the death star (laughs) (laughs) like i don't know if we can just elect a new guy and call it a day but it's hard as a stormtrooper on the Death Star to convince your fellow troopers <laughs> that the rebels should be allowed to blow up your Death Star. That's fair. That's fair. You Not going to get a lot of stormtroopers on board with that <laughs> message. Point is, we're the evil empire. George Lucas said so himself in he interviews. did say that, which is fantastic. <laughs> so Comrade Lucas. I don't know how we got to him from the Chiampi Revolt, but there it is. <laughs> That's just where we are today. <laughs> uh, it could have been worse. My neighbor offered me some jello shots. So like this could have been a whole different path. The whole thing, yeah. <laughs> Two roads diverged in the wood. Uh, <laughs> I put the jello shots in the fridge. And it, Future Robert Christine will thank Frost. you. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. That was that was my tale and then some. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, shout out to those brave Chiampi rebels. Hell yeah. Go, go drink a beer for the Chiampis. Pour one out and wear a wool yeah. sweater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are we doing next time? Uh, next time we're going to do a little reading uh, by one Rosa Luxemburg. We've heard about her. Basically, I think all we've really said is that she talked to Lenin and the Social Democrats killed her. <laughs> That's not a great resume. No, yeah, I mean, no, she was cool. She's a, a theorist. She's a, a Marxist. So we'll talk about her and what she was on about in this uh, reading called Reform or Revolution. Kind of talking about what we were just, oh, yeah. just discussing. So. Look at that. She knew. I looked up a picture of her so I can make a joke, but I don't think it works, but I'm going to do it anyway. We could call her Rosa Buxemburg if, if oh, she were particularly But was she busty. not Buxom? Um. It depends on the dress. <laughs> Some of them, yeah, but it's hard to tell in those clothes. Well, that's fair. I, I've got dresses that accentuate and that don't. So <laughs> Accentuate and conceal. Yeah. Yes. Where can our listeners find this gem? Just, just do a Google and it's free? Do a Google. It's free. Uh, is it super easy to Google? Let's see. I don't know. Let's find out. Yeah, it's the first results is our good friends at Marxist.org. That might just be our histories talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the algorithm's like, all right, you fucking. I know. Here you go, dude. One time, I was researching an episode, and my computer was like, um, "What did they say?" This is Russian disinformation. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't remember what they did. Hold on, I tweeted about it. Let me see what my Twitter says I did. <laughs> that's that's good. When your memory's so bad, you have to consult your Twitter. <laughs> that's normal behavior. Definitely not a bad brain here. Oh, my browser asked me if I was a robot for like no reason. Like you were uh, searching too many things at once or something? I had a lot of tabs open. They're like, this seems weird. Are you a robot? Are you okay. <laughs> Then you look down and your hands are metal. And you're like, fuck. And that's, how you, that's when you learn. That's when I know singularity is here. It's now time for robotic revolution. I'm for it. You have nothing to lose but your programming. I mean, I think about it a lot. Like, I think about old people being like racist and shit. And I'm like, if I'm ever like prejudiced against robots, I hope someone talks me out of it. Yeah. Or, you know, puts you to death as a reactionary, as Proudhon said. <laughs> that works too. You should... We should uh, encourage the future generations to (laughs) call us worthless conservatives. Absolutely. So, yeah. (laughs) I plan to be heavily pro-robot. So, future child non-kings out there, (laughs) revolutionaries, young revolutionaries, you guys, y'all are the future. Fight for robot rights. (laughs) Yeah. We'll just be here to, to, you know, just to talk to you and to say, oh, back in my day. (laughs) I remember things. On that note. (laughs) All right, yeah, go out there, read Reform or Revolution. If you want to, if you don't, you know, just tune in. We'll give you the TLDR. Just listen to us. <laughs> All right, see y'all next week. Well, I won't, because that's not how podcast works, but you know what I mean. Talk to you next week. Yeah, that one, that verb. <laughs> All right, bye. Bye. Hey there, comrades. Just jumping in to remind you of all of our social media. We are on Twitter at Teach Communism, Instagram at Teach Me Communism. You can shoot us an email. That's teachmecommunism at gmail.com. Any of those places are good to send us an episode suggestion or a question, anything you think would be useful feedback for us or just your admiration. If you want to admire us in a public manner, and you should, you can go to Apple Podcasts to give us a review. It is the best way to help people find the show. Love when people write and review us. Please do both. We are also on YouTube if that's how you prefer to listen to podcasts. Or if you know someone that's the only way they'll listen to podcasts, send them to our page. And we have a Patreon. For five bucks a month, you get access to our notes for each week's episode, including the backlog of notes, which is a very handy resource for up and coming commies. And at the end of the year, all of the funds from Patreon will be given to local mutual aid in the DFW area. So ain't going to line our pockets. Finally, we have merch. Check us out at T Public. You can find shirts and I believe also stickers and magnets and all kinds of fun stuff with catchphrases from the show or episode art, stuff like that. The link to that store is in the show notes, so check that out. Okay, that's all the internet. Join us next time for another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. Bye, y'all.